The scales will come off their eyes when they see my glory through you. So if you feel discouraged, if you feel dismayed, just remember that if they hate you, remember they hated him first, that you are not alone. Because in his kingdom, in his kingdom, the last shall be first. Hallelujah, hallelujah. The Lord has put something in my heart as soon as Sister over here was preaching her testimony. Some of us, maybe all of us, need to hear this. You are worthy. You are worthy. It doesn't matter what you've done in the past. Don't even get me started about my past because nobody wants to hear that. But it doesn't matter what I did or what I've done. What matters is what I do now and from here on forward. The enemy is going to attack you. The enemy is going to discourage you. But just know that you are worthy. Even if you fall, get back up. Dust yourself off. Keep going. You are worthy. You stand victorious through our Father. Through the mighty God, the Lord of hosts. Just like David stood against the giant, you stand against your giant. I don't know what that giant is. We all have different giants. We all have different obstacles. But stand against it. Stand face to face to it. And you show them who has your back. Show them then who has your back. You already have the armor. What else are you afraid of? You already have every weapon that you need. What else do you need? Stand against your, your giant. And use that sword, use that shield, use that belt, use that helmet, use whatever sandals he had on. <laughs> and the belt, whatever, everything that you need, you already have. So why do you have to worry? Because we all know worry isn't of God. Worry is not of God. So why even have it? Why even hold on to it? We know that we don't need it, so let it go. Right now, let it go. Let go that worry. Because once you let that worry go, faith comes in. And let that faith abound. When we are weak, he is strong. Remember that. When we are weak, he is strong. Now use that strength that he's given you. Use that strength to keep moving forward. Use that strength to push past those mountains, to push past those giants. Because you are worthy. You are worthy. We are victorious. We stand in victory, folks. We stand in victory. But we allow our circumstances to help forget and where we stand with God. Did you already forget that the enemy belongs on the bottom of our foot? Did you already forget that Satan has no power over you? Did you already forget? Of course we did because we allow our circumstances to change our mind. We allow our circumstances to distract and where we stand with God. Now it's time to put Satan where he belongs. It's time to remind Satan of where he's going to be in that lake of fire. Standing your healing, standing your faith, standing your courage. Because you are sons and daughters of God. You are meant to conquer this world. The earth belongs to you. That's why he created it. For us to thrive in his creation. How long are we going to allow the devil take control and what belongs to us? How long are we going to allow Satan take control of that? Really ask yourself. Because the world wants you to believe that you're weak. The world wants you to believe that we're a bunch of hypocrites. That our beliefs are fraud or fake or a facade. Let us be real. That's, that's what the world wants us to believe. That we stand in the wrong.
than what this world is going to. But you know what? If we don't stand for what we believe, then who will? Who will stand for what we believe? Who will stand on behalf of God if we don't? That's what the church is for, a body of Christ, a unity, a group, an army. And I'm not saying let's go out to battle with swords. No, let's go out to battle with love, with grace, with mercy. Let's show these people just because of what they think God is, isn't truly who God really is. God is full of love. God isn't full of hate. God is full of love. And he loves every single one of you just as much as he loves every single one of them. But he is a gentleman. God is a gentleman. He is not going to push somebody. But he will place you and I in front of those people to show them the grace, to show them the love. That's where we stand as a church. Hallelujah. Good morning, IBC. Good morning, saints. Good morning, family, in Jesus' name. I'm hearing something in my spirit this morning. When Noah was called by God, when he was anointed and chosen of God's saints to build the ark, he wasn't a great boat builder. He wasn't a, a perfection craftsman. He had faith. He had faith. When he was mocked, when he was scorned, when he was ridiculed, when they laughed at him, when they said, pretty much, they probably said, you're crazy. There's no rain, there's gonna be no storm, there's gonna be no flood. And this was over a hundred years in the name of Jesus. God is asking you saints today to press in and have that radical faith, faith of a mustard seed. We are God's people in Jesus' name. Died to self this morning. Hallelujah, hallelujah. The Lord is asking you, will you live in faith? Will you be faith walkers? Will you be faith believers? Will you be faith walkers in the name of Jesus? Will faith be flowing through your veins? Will Jesus' faith, Jesus, you are our faith. And God, you never lose a battle. When do you lose a battle, Lord? You are victorious every breath, every heartbeat. And that's the faith, saints, that he has graced us with. Every moment we breathe in the name of Jesus, raise your hands this morning. Give him a shout. Dance for him. Die to that flesh today. There is too much flesh in here this morning. Crush it. Crush it. Die. Die to self in the name of Jesus. Step out in faith. The Lord is challenging you today. Faith in the deep waters. Faith in the low valleys. Faith in the dark seasons. Faith when you have sickness in your body. Faith in every circumstance, in every situation. Believe and trust in the Lord. We're faith walkers in the name of Jesus. And Noah never gave up his faith. And he led his family. He didn't, his wife didn't come against him and mock him and say, no, you're crazy husband. God's not telling you to build this ark. She was in agreement with God and she was one flesh with her husband. And I pray over the married people, Holy Spirit is, the married ones in the name of Jesus, the ones that are one flesh under the holy covenant of God. I declare that your marriage is in the name of Jesus. Be an example of the gospel here on earth in Jesus' name. He's saying faith, faith, live in faith. Good morning, Pastor Tim. Good morning, brother. We love you. Praise God. Our pastors are back from their vacation. The rested, charged up, rejuvenated, on fire for the Lord in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 God bless you, God. Kimmy. Elders, they're all standing in place. Let's all stand up. Let's all stand up. Give glory to God. Amen. Hallelujah. This is God's time.
The morning is God's time. You're going to hear a bunch of word here in a little bit. Right now, just honor God. Just honor God. Just honor the Father. Just dip yourself right in in the name of Jesus. Just dip yourself right in in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, come. I invite you, Holy Spirit. We just want to make it all about you right now. That's all. We just want to make it all about you, Holy Ghost. That's all. We want to honor you right now. That's all. We want to honor the Lord. We want to honor the Lord right now. We just want to make it all about the Lord. We honor you, Father. We honor you. We honor you. Just put your eyes. Just set your gaze. So many of y'all just been used to listening to people. Listen to the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we invite you. Holy Spirit. The less flesh, the more Holy Ghost. The more you focus in on your own flesh, what you're thinking, what's going on, the less Holy Spirit. The more you give up, the more Holy Spirit comes in. Father, Father, Father. Yes, Father, we want to dive in a little bit deeper. We want to dive in a little bit deeper, Father. In Jesus' name. Jesus, Father, Jesus. We honor you right now. We honor you right now. We honor you right now, Lord. We honor you. You're worthy to be praised, Lord. You are worthy to be praised. You are worthy to be praised, Father. You're worthy to be praised. Go a little farther, go a little farther, go a little deeper. Clear your mind, clear your mind. Clear your mind, get into the Holy Ghost. Clear your mind. The Lord will work all those other things out. Stop worrying about them. Stop worrying about those other things. He'll work it out. He'll work it out in Jesus' name. Just give him some time right now. Give him all glory, give him all time right now. Yes, Lord, yes. Yes, Lord, Father, thank you, Lord. Father, thank you, Lord. King of kings, Lord of lords, just give them honor with your mouths. Give your mouths. You won't be silent when Jesus comes in the room, I promise you. It says every knee will bow. That means you're going to begin to start to praise him. Come on, open up your mouths. Open up your mouths. Open up your mouths. There you go. There you go. There you go. Just start honoring him. Just start honoring him. Start honoring the Lord. There you go. Start honoring the Lord. Start honoring the Lord. Give him glory. Give him honor. Give him honor. Give him honor. He's worthy. He's worth it. He's worth it. You're still alive, aren't you? He's worth it. Oh, he's worth it. He's worth it. Even in the middle of trials and tribulations, He's worth it. Even when you don't believe, He's still alive. He's still very much alive. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. There you go. There you go. Come on. Come on. Press in. Press in. Press into the Lord. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah, we honor you, Jesus. We honor you, Lord. Press into the Lord, press into the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 There you go. Tear down those walls of worry and flesh. Hallelujah. Tear down those walls of worry and flesh. Hallelujah. Here they go. They come tumbling down. I can see them come tumbling down right now. There you go. Very good, church. There you go, hallelujah. Break it down. Break yourself down right here before the Lord. Break yourself down before the Lord right here. Put an altar. Make an altar right here. Make an altar right here. Make an altar right here. Make an altar of sacrifice right here. This is the point. This is the time where you say, I give it all. This is the point where you say, I'm tired. I give it all to you. No more fighting against you, Lord. No more questioning you. But to you be all the honor and glory and power. To you be all the honor and glory and power. To you be all the honor and glory and power, Lord. To you be all the honor and glory and power. Hallelujah. There you go. Press in a little bit more. I can sense a church, there you go. 
Lord, yes, Lord, I pray with my spirit, I pray, our Lord. Abba Father, Abba Father, Abba Father, Abba Father. Abba Father, Abba Father, Abba Father. Abba Father, Abba Father, Abba Father. Yes, hallelujah, press into Jesus. We press into you, Lord. We press into you, Lord. Yes, Father, you got a word for us today, Lord. You got a word for us today. Yes. Yes, give it all right now. All fleshly things, give it to the Lord. We got to be holy and pure before the fire of the Lord. He'll take care of the rest. He'll take care of the rest. He'll take care of the rest. There you go, there you go, there you go, there you go. There you go, there you go, there you go. There you go, there you go. Honor the Lord, just honor Him. We're going to start church in a little bit. Just honor the Lord. That's why you're here, isn't it? That's why you're here, to get a touch from Jesus. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit. That's all we need, Holy Ghost. All we need is the Holy Ghost. All we need is the Holy Ghost. All we need is the Holy Spirit. All we need is the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah, Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit. All we need is the Holy Spirit. the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, break the walls down a little bit more. Break the walls down a little bit more. How hungry are you today? How thirsty are you today? How hungry are you today? How thirsty are you today? How hungry, how thirsty are you? Lord, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Oh, Father, I just want to love on you right now. I just want to love on you right now. Make straight paths for your people, Father. Make straight paths for your people, Father. Bring clarity. There's a lot of spirit of confusion today. There's a lot, a heavy spirit of confusion. A lot of it, I can sense it today. A lot of it, church, you're confused. There's a lot of confusion. Which way? What am I doing? Where am I? Do I go this? Do I go that? Do I stay here? Where do I go from here? What, what am I doing? My feeling says this, or this. A lot of confusion, a lot of confusion. We come against the spirit of confusion today. You devil of confusion, I come against you right now. I hold you accountable right now. Stand up and remove yourself out of this place in Jesus' name. I bind a spirit of confusion today in the name of Jesus. I bind a spirit of confusion today in the name of Jesus. I bind a spirit of confusion today in the name of Jesus. I bind you. I bind you. There will be no confusion in the body of Christ. When we don't know what to do, we can always believe and trust and abide in the shadow of the Almighty. We can always abide in the shadow of the Almighty. What do I have to be confused about? I can always hide under his wings. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. No confusion today. No confusion today. No confusion today. No confusion today. Spirit of confusion, stand attention in Jesus' name. I rebuke you out of this place. By the name of Jesus Christ, 
Jesus. Jesus. You lesser torturing spirits, I bind you right now in the name of Jesus and I send you out of this place to dry and arid places in Jesus' name. Yeah, y'all sense that light right there? Huh? Now you praise him. Now worship him, now worship him, worship him. We worship the king, we worship the king. Now worship the Lord, now worship the Lord. Now worship the Lord. There you go, I see spirits glowing right now. Now worship the Lord. Worship the Lord, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. You are worthy, Lord, you are worthy, you are worthy. Hallelujah. Father, I pray for every saint that's on their way right now in the name of Jesus, Father. I pray over a bickering spirit right now in the name of Jesus, an argumentative spirit, Father. In the name of Jesus, you silence right now in Jesus' name. For the body of Christ will be in one peace, one mind, one accord in the name of Jesus. Letting, dealing with each other, gracing each other with each other's issues in the name of Jesus. We grace each other right now, Lord. We grace each other right now. If you have ought against anybody right now, just forgive. Just forgive for the sake of getting a word from the Lord today. Just forgive in Jesus' name. Oh, yes. Hallelujah. 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 Yeah, right there. I hit a vein right there. Yes, just forgive. They may be loved ones. Those may be people right now that they may not even be in here at home. Wherever they're at, just forgive, just forgive, just forgive. There you go, cast it to the Lord, cast it to the Lord. Cast it to the Lord, cast it to the Lord. Cast it to the Lord, hallelujah. Yeah, cast those cares onto the Lord, for he cares for you, amen. He cares for you. He cares for you. He cares for you. He cares for you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We thank you, Father. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise team, come on up in Jesus' name. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, you're worthy to be praised. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. The first mention of the word worship was it came by Abraham's mouth. It came from Abraham's mouth. And he mentioned worship when he said, me and my son are going to go up to the mountain. And we all know that that mountain was a sacrifice. That's what he was going to do. He was going to sacrifice his son. But Abraham didn't call it sacrifice in that moment. He called it worship. That means worship and sacrifice are the same. You understand? That means it takes sacrifice for you to worship God. I know your flesh don't want to. It don't always want to. My flesh don't always want to. But I sacrifice my flesh and I go like this. I sacrifice it. You understand? That's worship. Amen? Yeah, worship. I worship the Lord. Amen? Give an ear to God today. Amen? Give an ear to the Lord as we go on, as we begin to worship the Lord. Know that this is a sacrifice. True worship cannot be without sacrifice. Amen? Jesus. Jesus. Hallelujah. Sister Nina, come on up here and just... Pray us in and let's get this thing started in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Who's happy to be in the house this morning? Y'all look so beautiful this morning. I missed y'all so, so much. But what I'm going to tell you, I 
missed the most was that corporate anointing that brings the presence of God in this house. Hallelujah. I would like all y'all to stand up at attention. The Lord is here. The Lord is here and he is moving. And he's ready to do a work in your heart this morning. Who's ready to receive it? Who's ready to receive it? Hallelujah. Father God, we thank you for meeting us here. We thank you that your presence saturates this place, Father God. We thank you that you are with the people of IBC, that we are your people and you are our God, Father. We're going to worship you this morning. We're going to give you the honor and the glory you deserve. We're going to surrender our hearts right now. We're going to surrender our worries, our stresses in the name of Jesus. Right now. Just let it go and give it to the Lord. Let that be your sweet sacrifice. Let that be your
us are free. Here you go. I am free.
thank you, Father.
time church sing it out loud my chains are your grace and your mercy is renewed each morning how many of y'all tapped into that grace and that mercy this morning how many of y'all could use some of that new grace and that new mercy I don't know about y'all but I don't even want a one day old mercy I want brand new mercy every morning brand new grace every morning and that's what the Lord offers us this morning hallelujah I receive it and I believe it who is with me in this house Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, wow. What a beautiful ham. What he's done for us. I don't know about y'all, but I've been saved from a lot. Much grace was offered to save my life. And his hands had to get really filthy to pull me out of the mess that I was in. Does, do anybody else have a testimony like that out here? Can anybody relate to God getting dirty so he can jump in that mess that you're in to pull you out? That's the grace that he's offered us. Amen. Hallelujah. How many of y'all back this morning? How many of y'all wanted to continue to worship him in tithe and in offering? Hallelujah. 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 I know I am ready. We've been... Uh, on our vacation with our children and we just came back in fact we were on the road this morning just getting in the presence of God so we can meet you here and I told my husband just drive by the house and I would jump out <laughs> don't even stop 
But it, it gives us a good picture, relaxing, finding his peace, finding that rest, getting away from the busyness of life and just enjoying what he has provided for you. It puts things back in perspective when you're in the right scenery and you begin to see like a forest or a lake or an ocean, something that's real ser serene. When you're worshiping him with the backdrop of his creation, it's like, oh, yes, Lord. It says in the word of God that he not only provides all things, but he also provides for our enjoyment. Hallelujah. So anytime we go on vacation, I'm like, Lord, I know you provided this enjoyment for us. And we're going to find that rest. And we're going to fully enjoy this enjoyment that you provided to the utmost. It's a godly thing to find your rest. Amen. It's a godly thing to work hard and play hard. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. So this morning, I'm really, really grateful. Putting things back in perspective. My goodness, the Lord provides for our enjoyment. He provides our rest. He provides all things. Amen. All good things come from up above. Amen. And how many of y'all know that the Bible says all things belong to him? All things belong to him in the earth. And so all means all, right? So how many of y'all know that our possessions and our money belong to him too? It's kind of a weird concept if you haven't uh, learned that in the word of God, if you don't know this precept. Because you might think, well, I work for my money. God didn't work for this. Yeah, but who's, whose air are you using <laughs> when you're breathing in and out of your lungs to go to work every morning? Whose grace and mercy is there to meet you, to grace you with life, to get up, to go to work? It's the Lord's, amen? So if the Bible says all things belong to him, all things belong to him. So what the lesson is to be learned with that scripture is we are just merely stewards of what he's given us. Even when it comes to parenting, my children, I will gladly say they belong to him, especially when they're bad. <laughs> Those are your kids, Lord. You need to do something about this. We are only being stewards of everything that we have here. And if you look at it through that avenue or through, through that scope, it's kind of like saying, Lord, I, I'm not giving you a piece of this, but how much of this of, that belongs to you should I keep for myself? It's not so much saying, how much do I need to give you, God? But if it all belongs to him, then you need to think of it in a way of it. How much should I keep what already belongs to you for myself? And have I been using what you've given me for your kingdom purposes? Or has it just been about me and myself and I? Has it been about just me and my world and my children and just my, mine, mine, my, me, 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 I, 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 I? He provides for your enjoyment. You don't have to fear not having enough for yourself. He's not that kind of daddy. He's not that kind of God. If he asks you to give some, it's because he's got a double portion for you in the end. You know, we don't give to give, but oh my goodness, does he give when you obey? He's a very rewarding father, and if you obey him, he rewards you every single time. He's just that type of God. It just works out that we serve a God like that. That if you, if you diligently seek him, he will reward you. Amen? It's just a part of his character. It's a part of his attributes, who he is. If you press in, you're going to find yourself in goodness and overwhelmed with blessing. You can't outgive God, y'all. So if you're fearful in this area of tithe and offering, my goodness, there's an area where you're not fully matured. It says by the renewing of the mind that you, you, you have to be renewed and transformed by the renewing of your mind. You can enjoy further enjoyment, more of the blessing if you obey in this area. And I know some of y'all may not understand that, but the simple act of obeying what the word of God says, if you were to test him in this area, he even says, test me. Go ahead and do it. 
it. Test me and let me prove to you that the promises that are tied to a tither and the giver will overwhelm you. You need to understand what we have in our hands is very little. What we have in our possession is very little in comparison of what he wants to give us. It's like us holding on to this very little and he's saying, okay, if you prove faithful in the little, I will deem you faithful in the much. But you have to be faithful to release that little unto me joyfully and with a heart of joy. And when you do, it's like there's a little button in heaven, a little valve in heaven that he just switches over and the overflow is able to come. Amen? How many of y'all want that valve to be open on your behalf? <laughs> it takes a while to get here to have this understanding. It takes stewardship in the Word of God. You have to begin to be a steward not only in your time, not only in your funds, but in the Word of God. Because this may be foreign what I'm talking to you about. You may think, what is this woman talking about? She just wants my funds. No, 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 no. The funds don't come to me. I'm just a minister of the Lord. Amen. It goes to Jesus Christ and his kingdom. If this is foreign to you, it's because you need to become a steward in learning the precepts of God. You know, if you jump off the highest building, there's a law of gravity here on earth. You're going to go splat. Whether you believe it or not, try it, and I bet you I'll be right. <laughs> Just go ahead and put me on your wheel, please. There's law in the heavens. There's spiritual laws that are enforced. Whether you choose to believe it or not, they are what they are. And you will not reach the overflow if you're not walking in obedience to the priests of God. Amen. So some of us got to grab a hold of spiritual disciplines in our life. This is a spiritual discipline that you need to grab a hold of. The Bible talks a lot about wealth, and it talks a lot about wealth being tied to our maturity in Christianity. Amen? I'm going to read this to you, and I want you to open up your ears and listen, okay? The Bible relates not only the use of time to our spiritual condition, but also our use of money. So it's relating our use of money to our spiritual condition. Amen? The disciplined use of money requires that we manage it in such a way that our needs and those of our family are met. Amen? Does everybody agree with this? In fact, the Bible denounces any professing Christian who fails to care for the physical needs of his family because of financial irresponsibility, slothful mismanagement, or waste as a hypocrite. Did y'all catch that? If anyone does not provide for his relatives and especially for his immediate family, y'all can look it up. 1 Timothy 5, 8 says firmly, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Woo! Don't shoot the minister, y'all. This is the word of God. This is a neonology. This is simply coming from the word of God. Y'all look it up. It's 1 Timothy 5, 8. How much more are we to give to the things of God's kingdom and our family in the Lord? Amen. So how we use money for ourselves, for others, especially for the sake of God's kingdom, is from first to last a spiritual issue. And if it's a spiritual issue, we can just say that it's a heart issue. It's an understanding issue. Amen? Why is a biblical use of our money and resources so crucial to our growth in godliness? Does anybody want to grow in godliness in this house? Does anybody want to grow to the full stature of maturity in Christ? That is our whole objective as, Christi as Christians, is it not? But it says we are to train ourselves in this manner. We have to train to become godly. Did you, did you know that? 
Godliness doesn't just fall like manna from heaven. No, the power of God falls like manna from heaven. And you use that power of God to train yourself in godliness in every avenue of your life. In time, in relationships, in your funds, in Jesus' name. The ones that are trained, the ones that you see walking around full of God's power, full of godliness, full of righteousness, full of holiness, they didn't just get that way by waking up one morning. They got there by training their bodily members. Amen? Amen? Amen. Why is a biblical use of our money and resources so crucial to our growth in godliness? For one thing, it's a matter of sheer obedience. Everybody say obedience. A surprisingly large amount of scripture deals with the use of wealth and possessions. If we ignore it or take it lightly, our godliness will be a sham. It will be a sham. You will be a hypocrite. We have to take in the whole counsel of the word of God not just a piece, amen? The reason use of money and the things it buys is one of the best indications of spiritual maturity and godliness is that we invest most of our days working in exchange for money. How many can relate to that? How much time do we spend at work? It seems like, you know, if you're a stay-at-home mom, like your husband spends most of his time at work and not with us, right? When you were working or if you're you're retired or whatnot, do you remember the days when you worked so hard? That's why people go for retirement, which I really don't believe in retirement. I believe in in, in getting off of uh, worldly work so I can go full-time in the ministry. That's what I believe, but that's another time. I'll speak on that another time. We spend most of our time working for the money that we live off of, right? That's why it's so important. This is a very real sense that our money represents us. Therefore, how we use it expresses who we are, what our priorities are, what's in our hearts. As we use our money and resources Christianly, we prove our growth in Christ-likeness. How many of y'all heard this saying, show me your friends and I'll tell you who you are. Show me your checkbook and I can tell you a little bit about yourself too. Hallelujah. (laughs) Hallelujah. Did anybody grab anything from that this morning? During this time of tithe and offering, I'm going to be bringing to you the disciplines of stewardship when it comes to your finances. And I want to bring to you not only just the the obedience part on what you are to do, but also the blessing that occurs as a result of your obedience. Amen? And I pray that you grab a hold of that. How many of you are ready to give to the Lord? Hallelujah. Go ahead and grab your envelopes. Hold them up. Hold your phone if you're giving online in Jesus' name. If you're giving through mail, just raise up your hands. If you've already done it, go ahead and raise up your hand. We're going to do this in faith, Lord. We do this because we love you, Father God. We do this because it's in your word. We do this because it's a sign of our maturity in the word of God concerning our finances. We do this because we understand that everything comes from you and everything belongs to you, Lord. And if you're asking for a portion of it, Father God, my goodness, it's only because you're going to bless the rest and multiply it. And we choose to believe that in the name of Jesus, and we freely give it to you in Jesus' name. Whatever you ask, Lord, it is yours. It already belongs to you, Father God. But you won't rip it out of our hands, Lord. You need a willing heart, a willing vessel, a joyful heart heart a cheerful giver and I believe that's what we have this morning do I have anybody agree with me today hallelujah bless the tithe bless the offering and multiply it in Jesus name and everybody that agrees with me says amen amen Amen. keep playing that sister just let the keys just fill this room Let us just bask in the presence of the Lord. 
Hallelujah. <laughs> you are here, Holy Spirit. You are here. Hallelujah. Keep going, sister. Sometimes they teach you in science that we come from monkeys and things like that. And you're going to have to remember what you learned 
here in church. Do you understand? They're going to tell you all kinds of weird stuff, but you remember what we learned here in, in church, all right? And you have to remember these things. Church, I just want you to extend their hands, and let's just start praying over them, over their minds. Lots of things get, get uh, taught in school, and we got to block their ears to not hear those things, amen? But that they hear what we're teaching them. Lord, in the name of Jesus, lay hands on them, Kim. Lay hands on them. In the name of Jesus, lay hands on them, Dad. Lay hands on them, elders, all of them. In Jesus' name, we cover you. We cover you. In Jesus' name, you're going to get used. You're going to get used strongly in the Lord. You're going to get used for the Lord. You got to be brave. Be brave. You can't be like the rest. You can't be like the rest of the kids. When all the other kids go making fun of other kids, you don't do that. You don't go laughing with the rest of them. You got to be different. You got to be there and you got to help the ones that are in need. Do you understand? Whenever other kids are laughing at other kids, you don't do that. You don't laugh. You have to be there to help. You defend. You defend the ones that are getting mistreated. Do you all understand me? You defend the ones that are getting mistreated. Don't ever be like the world and go laughing at other people. Don't ever be like the world. You got to be different, okay? You got to be different. Father, in Jesus' name, I send protection blessing over them, Lord. Protection blessing. The hedge of protection over them, Lord. A hedge of protection, Lord, in the name of Jesus on all four sides of them. We cover them by the blood of Jesus Christ. We cover their minds as they start school, Father, this week and next week, Lord. Father, we cover their minds and their ears, Father, that they be able to hear wrong teaching. That they be able to hear wrong teaching and know and know and remember what Pastor Tim is saying today. And remember what their teachers are saying today. In Jesus' name, extend them. Just extend your hands this way and release faith over them. Don't you know the devil wants the children? I remember in my U.S. history class, I remember a statement that Hitler made while he was trying to take over the world. And he made this one statement and he said, give me the children and I'll take over everything. That's all he said. He said, give me the children and I'll take over the whole world. He knows that children can be trained. You understand? So we got to block our children from wrong training. You understand? That comes through prayer. I feel a heaviness for this right now. I feel a heaviness over our children's protection. In Jesus' name. Oh, Father, let none of them be robbed, Lord. Let none of them be robbed, Lord. In Jesus' name. Let none of them be robbed. It says that the children ran to Jesus and he touched them. He blessed them. And that's what we do, what Jesus did. In Jesus' name, we don't, we don't deny the children. We let them run to the Lord. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Keep praying. Just keep praying. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. A little bit of ministering going on here. There you go. A little bit of ministering. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you. This is a serious thing. Cover them. Cover them. Cover them. Cover them. It's a serious thing. Some of them start this week. Some of them are going to start next week. Cover them, Lord. Start praying for the teachers. I sense a heaviness to bind a spirit of alcoholism over our teachers. I sense a heaviness to bind alcoholism over our teachers. It's a lot. They have a lot of weight, a lot of things they deal with our children. And a lot of them, they go to alcoholism to kind of soften things down. And, and I, I just pray heavy over that. I pray heavy over a spirit of alcoholism over our teachers in the, in the city of Fort Worth, Father. In Jesus' name, Lord. That they be patient, Lord. We need teachers that are patient. Lord, with our children, Lord. In Jesus' name, Lord. Pray over the principles. Pray over those who are putting the curriculum together. Yes, the counselors. Pray over the counselors of the school when they talk to some of these kids that come in from hard homes. 
that our children be a beacon of light, that they not be like the world. Our kids cannot be like the world. We bless our children, Lord. We bless our future, Father. You said you blessed Abraham because you knew he would teach his children, Father. That's why you blessed him, Lord. In the same way, Father, we bless our children. We send them off to their schools, Father, with divine protection. Amen. And amen, amen. Amen. Fill them with the Holy Spirit, Lord. Yes, Lord. <laughs> Man, from the kindergarten, she said, all right. Amen. Amen. Good ministry right here. I've got to know the Holy Spirit's doing something right here in Jesus' name, right here. Right here, the Lord is doing something right here in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Father, be with the parents, Father, that they not worry, Father. Be with our parents, Lord. Check your kids' homework. Check what they're teaching them, parents. You understand? The devil is on the prowl like a lion. Don't you know that? Check their homework. Check what they're learning in science, especially in science. Especially in science, the Big Bang Theory, all that kind of stuff. You can check your children's work. You got to combat what they're trying to teach through worldliness. The enemy is doing that, the enemy. And when you see stuff like we come from monkeys and the Big Bang and things like that, co I'll contradict it and say, look, look, this is what we know though. We didn't come from monkeys. Monkeys didn't just change. We, Adam and Eve, remember Genesis? You got to teach them that. Make that louder than what your, the, the school systems are teaching them. Do you, you understand what I'm saying? Make it louder. Check their homework. Check what they're learning. Mothers, check what they're learning. Fathers, oversee your families. Amen. We bless them all. We bless them all. In Jesus' name I pray. And we all say? Amen. Amen. Okay, y'all can go to school. I mean, go to school. Y'all can go to class. Oh, well, yeah, school, I guess. Huh? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Amen. There goes the future. We were once there, weren't we? And now what are we doing? We're changing the lives of people, aren't we? Amen. Let's give a hand for the Lord. What a beautiful thing. Hold that right there, Miss Alice. Hold that right there. What a beautiful thing to be in the presence of the Lord. Amen. Father, we thank you, Father. We give all honor and respect to the Word of God now. The Word that brings life, Lord. The Word that is a light unto my feet, a light unto my path. It's a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. It shows me where to go when I don't know. Father, we give full respect and honor to the Word of God being delivered today, Lord. I pray that it penetrate our hearts, Lord, the way it penetrated the patriarchs of old, Lord. When you spoke to Noah, when you spoke to Abraham, they changed their lives. They believed. They left all that they had and they went towards it, Lord. Since knowing that we are surrounded by a host of people of faith even up there with you these patriarchs are there with you now and the word says they're encouraging us to move on towards faith there are people before you maybe great aunts great uncles great 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 grandparents that prayed over you they lifted up a prayer and the, whore, the Lord still hears it as if they lifted it up now. 
I want to give you a thought. Me and my wife were talking one day. This is the other day, and my wife said, man, the blood of Jesus still cries out. And I said, you know what? It reminds me of Cain and Abel. It says, when Cain took Abel's life, the Lord said, I still hear his blood crying out to me from the earth. And I'm telling you, Jesus' blood that fell to the earth still cries out. It still is going out forth, still being heard. Amen. Oh, Father, let us hear those words today and let it land on good ground. In Jesus' name I pray. And we all say, Amen. Say it again. Amen. Amen, amen means you agree with me. Amen. So be it. Amen. So be it. Thank you. Let's turn to Matthew 24, 36. I want to continue on with the life of, uh, with Noah. We read about Noah, and we, uh, if, if you here were here last week, man, we got some good revelation out of that, out of his sons, right? Remember that? His sons, that one of them didn't cover the Lord, and I mean, didn't cover Noah, and the other two did, and they were blessed. The Lord, uh, Noah blessed them, but he didn't bless the one that left him uncovered. And remember what I was telling you, that message was, the Lord doesn't like unexposed sin. He wants to cover it. He wants to cover it so much, he used that life of the three sons, the one that didn't cover his father's exposure, ended up getting a curse. And the ones that did cover, what they were doing is they were walking in line with a promise that says the Lord keeps no record of wrong. Do you understand? If you don't know what I'm talking about, go listen to last week's sermon. It was a good one. I don't have time to go over it again today, but we're going to continue on in the spirit of Noah and what Noah was doing and what he was talking about. And I want you to turn to Matthew 24, 36. And we're going to start right here. I'm going to read out of the NIV today. And I want to use Noah's life in the way that Jesus wanted to teach his disciples during that time of why Noah did what he did and he decided what he decided to do and what he chose to leave behind, amen? And then what his reward was for doing that, amen? Amen. We're going to have a spirit of teaching today, amen? Matthew 24, 36. This is what it says. This is the red letter. So Jesus is talking. If you don't have a Bible with the red letter, Jesus is talking here. And he says, no one knows about that day or hour or even the angels in heaven nor the son, but only the father. As it was in the days of who? All right. Same as it is the days of Noah, he's going to go on to explain some things. He said, in the same as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Ah, so he's talking about when Jesus returns. He says, just like that story with Noah, in the same way when I come back to you, it's going to be the same thing. Verse 38. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. You know, I thought about this and I said, you know, I believe what the word of God says. When that fl flood came, somebody was in their happiest moment of their life getting married but they didn't know Christ. They didn't give honor to God. When that flood came, people were enjoying each other's company in their living rooms. They were celebrating family that came over to visit over the weekend. During that flood, moments before, while Noah was entering into the ark, people were preparing their wedding gowns and the groom was preparing to take his new wife and start a new life with children. There were grandparents ready to see the wedding and 
children running around and the girls with the flowers and the boys dressed in their nice little sweating suits. Do you understand? While Noah was entering the ark. There were moments going on in life where babies were being born, newborns. Mothers were giving life. Fathers were happy lifting up their babies. My son, my daughter, come celebrate with me while Noah was entering the ark. This was going on normal daily life. Some had left their home and went on vacation or went to another city to visit some family members out in some other. This is what's happening while Noah was entering the ark. There was, I find it interesting that there was only a few, I mean a handful compared to what was going on in the world that actually heard the voice of God. The rest were living on, doing what makes them happy. Missed it. It says, for in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying. They were marrying. They were in their wedding dresses. And they were giving in marriage. In other words, they were in the moment. In their moment of consummating marriage, you understand? Up to the day that Noah entered the ark, verse 39, and they knew nothing about what would happen until the, the flood came and took them all away. Man, you imagine that. They knew nothing about what was going to happen. They didn't have a clue. There was only a few that picked up on something and said, the Lord wants me to do something. There was only one man during all that time that picked up, his little antennas were up, and he said, uh, I think something serious is coming in our near future. And I'm picking up that we need to start building something so that people can come in and be saved from what's coming. I mean, the gospel came on Noah in that moment. Noah in that moment was a spreader of the gospel. And I want you to see, notice, there was a lot of good life going on when that happened. They didn't listen. They knew nothing about what would come up to the flood that came to them, uh, that took them all, the, all away. That is how, look what it says here. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. We're talking about Jesus. When Jesus comes, people will be marrying and on vacation. People will be at each other's houses, preparing the wedding gowns, paid just what they needed to pay to have that rental for the beautiful banquet and the people to come. People will be at work doing their normal things. People will be driving their trucks and at their computers typing. People will be going on in normal days. Some will be driving airplanes and others will be driving vehicles and Drivers of Amazon, you know, and drivers of, of all these other trucking companies. Do you understand? There's going to be a lot of things normally going on. Some of us may be at our computers and all of a sudden the moment is here. We don't know, do we? But yet for some reason, Noah picked up on something. He knew I need to remain blameless. He knew. He didn't know when the rain was coming, but he knew that something was coming ahead, so he was preparing his life for that moment. He was preparing a life and his children's life for, and his, his whole family for a moment he didn't know when. But he knew that if he prepared and got everything ready, 
when the moment came, he would know what to do. He would be saved. You understand? It means that he took the rest of his life from that moment. I'm sure he was there living life like normal, picking up water, getting food, preparing, trying to extend his land, whatever it is. But from that moment on, the first priority came that there is something coming in the near future that I must be ready for. Jesus said, in the same way, that will be the return of Jesus. My question is, how many Noahs are going to be here today? How many Noahs are there going to be prepared, ready? We don't know when, but we can live a life of readiness. Because we don't know, do we? Verse 40, look what it says here. Just in case you think I was kidding around. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken away and the other left. When Jesus returns, this is no joke. Wouldn't it be the worst thing to be out there with a family member? And all of a sudden, when Jesus returns, one staying and the other went. I don't want that for my family. I want my family story to say there were five and then five gone. Woo! There was five of them there and they're just gone. I want there to be a moment where there was a house there full of people, full of life, and all of a sudden in a moment, they ain't there. The whole house is gone. This is going to be a reality. Can you imagine what it'll be like when people just come up missing? This is the truth. It says two men will be in the field. One will be taken away and the other one left. 41, two women will be grinding with a hand mill. I believe this will be true. I believe along with other many things, there will be two people grinding with a hand mill. One will be taken away and the other left. Like a flood, it's going to come. People will be doing their normal daily things. Talking about the normal things that they talk about and planning about a future. Does that make sense? 42. It says, therefore, keep watch. Say that word with me, watch. There's something about that word that the Lord has been speaking to me, and he's been speaking it to me for a little bit now, because that's the word that Jesus used whenever he caught his disciples sleeping. Jesus used, he came up, he said, what are you doing? You should be praying. You can't even pray for a little bit, and he gives them two instructions, watch and pray. That's what he says. That's an exact reflection. You don't know when Jesus is going to return. Those disciples had no clue when Jesus would come back from his prayer and meditation. But in the moment he came, it was in a moment they were least expecting it. It was in a moment where the waiting is so long. Have you ever waited for someone and waited and waited? Husbands, can I get an amen? Have you ever waited for, you know? Just waited, and finally you all get to the point where you just, just gave in, you know, waiting. It's going to be like that. It's going to be a time when the weight in you is not going to be there anymore, and it's going to take every faith thing that you got in you to continue standing. Because you don't know when that moment will come. But all I know, I know for sure you don't want to be the one left. Two will be working, one will be left. It says, therefore, keep watch. Watch. Don't get caught sleeping spiritually. 
Keep your spirit alert on God. Keep your mind on Christ. Even when things don't go look good for you. Even when it looks like things are going bad for you. The sale didn't happen. The business idea didn't go through. The bill didn't get paid. You understand? In the midst of life, keep Jesus at the forefront. Why? Because you don't know when he's coming. Live a life of readiness. Be above reproach. Remember there's a grace on you like Noah. Noah, he saw no record of wrong with Noah. And last week we talked about it. You who are in Christ, he sees no record of wrong with you when you're in Christ. Keep the record going. Keep that record clean, amen? I mean, when you miss it, come back and say, man, my gosh, quickly. Father, forgive me for that, Lord. I repent. Let me get back in here. Simple as that. Don't stay out there in the la-la land. Don't stay out there in those areas of we're not sure this and that. No, 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 no. That's what last week's sermon was. The Lord don't like uncovered sin. He wants to cover you so that you can be prepared for the time that's coming. Because we don't know. But we can be like Noah, prepared. But you have to keep watch. Watch what's going on in the signs, the times. I'm going to give you a real simple, I want to give you a simple little thing. This is a simple thing. So that you know that the times are coming. Because some of us don't, aren't into Bible prophecy and they're not in, you, you know, you, the signs that here, these are the signs coming. We see all that. Some of us aren't all into that. We understand. But I'm going to give you a simple one because I'm a simple man. Here's a simple thing. In the end times, in Revelations, it says that Israel will return to their tabernacle. They'll return to the killing of the goats and the bulls because it says that the Antichrist will remove it again. He'll stop all those things. So that means a layman's term is, if you ever start seeing Israel returning to what they used to do with Moses, It's near. Because Revelation says that the Antichrist will come and he's going to remove all of that again. They're going to want to return to that. And he'll remove it again. Keep your eye on Israel. If you ever heard, I heard on the news when 2020 came around, the priests were begging. They were begging the president of Israel we need to sacrifice again for COVID. He was pressured. I mean, could you imagine a bunch of Jews coming up saying, hey, this is on you. You're the one. If we don't do that, we got to start making sacrifices. God is angry. They were pressuring him. He didn't do it, though. Wasn't time yet. You understand? That's a simple one. Simple one for IBC. When you see Israel returning back to doing what they did in Moses, the cutting of the, the, the bulls and, the, and the, 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 the sacrifices, you know we're close. Watch, he's saying. Watch. Don't think and go on and be marrying this and that. I'm going to get home and I'm going to get a family. I'm going to get no, no. Be on watch also. Be on a readiness also. You might not make it to your wedding. It says many will be in the process of marrying. You understand what I'm saying? You got to put the return of Christ higher than anything in your life. I mean, it's got to be so high that when you start missing the mark, you have a fear. You know what? I better not mess up because in this moment, I remember there was a pastor that said, don't smoke anymore. Leave the smoking. Why? Because if you inhale and then you get to heaven, you're going to out... Oh, Lord, I just blew out in heaven. You don't want to be the one releasing, exhaling your smoke in heaven. Be ready. You don't know. 
Those things that you do that you want to get away with and you feel like you've gotten away with for some time, be careful. You don't know if in that moment, boom, and like lightning it says he'll return. Have that in mind. God, do I do this? I don't know. This could be a moment here. And your life needs to be living like that, above reproach. That makes sense? So we say, man, that's a fear. Of the, that's, that's like in a constant fear. Yeah, it's a different kind of fear, though. It's a respect. Because my daddy might come in the room. I got to be careful what I'm looking like here. He just might open the door and walk in. Am, am I appropriate? Am, am I ready? Those women that had the oil, they had their oil lamps burning, ready to go. Why did they need their oil lamps? Because he might come at night. Keep your light burning even at night time. In the wee hours of the nighttime, keep your light burning. Don't give in to things. Do you understand what I'm saying? Speaking by the Spirit here. He says, keep watch. Therefore, keep watch because you don't know on what day your Lord will come. Be like Noah. Prepare your ark. Get people in the ark. Get people in with Jesus Christ. It says, you don't know when the Lord will come. But understand this. If the, oh, this is, let me really put in on that. Understand this, okay? Jesus is telling you, please understand this, okay? It says, if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. If you knew when your house was going to get broken into, remember that time when they broke in and broke in your car or broke in whatever? Remember that time you had some theft, somebody stole some things from you? If you'd have known when that was going to happen, you'd have been ready, right? But what was it? It was a moment you were caught when you just wasn't thinking about it, were you? I didn't think to lock it. I didn't think to park it all the way in. I didn't think to close everything. I didn't prepare for it that day. And that's when the thief came. He said, understand this. It says, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. 44, so you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Jesus just likened himself unto a thief that comes and you don't even know it. Did you see that? Jesus himself likened himself to a thief. When does a thief come? When you least expect it. I mean, it's just a dumb thief to do it right in the open. Even the thieves know you come at night. Why? Everyone's asleep. No one's expecting they're all in their nice homes thinking that the walls will protect them. Thinking that the Schlage lock on the door will be invincible. They're all in their homes thinking that those glass windows will keep everybody and everything out. You understand? Don't trust in the man-made things. You got to be ready. You got to have a life ready. Because Jesus will come like a thief. You won't know. It says, so you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you did not expect him. Who then, watch this, who then is the faithful and wise servant? I love that. Jesus is saying, you don't know when I'm going to return, but who's the faithful and wise one? I love it that there he doesn't say, who's the one that has the greatest ability? Because when it comes to this moment, it doesn't matter whether you're a great, have great abilities to preach, or you have awesome abilities to do this and that. He's not looking for ability. He's looking for the what? Faithful. Do you see that? I like that word. The Lord commends 
faithfulness rather than ability. In that scripture right there when it says, who then is the faithful? He didn't say, who then is the, the, the one with the most ability? Who is the one that gained the most? Who is the one? No, no, no. He looked in there and said, who then is the faithful in this moment? Who kept their faith with me? Who didn't drop their faith during the waiting? Who didn't fall asleep during the waiting? Who didn't get distracted by some other person, thing, or idea during the waiting when Jesus would return? Man, listen to me what I just said. Who will not be distracted by a person, a place, or a thing while waiting on Jesus to return? That's what he's saying. Who kept their eyes on me? This is a big deal. Well, there's a holy fear in the room, amen? It's good. Be afraid. You know how afraid you need to be? Working out your salvation with fear and... Oh, I love when you tell me, ah, Tim, but that, he's talking about a reverent fear. I don't know about you, but a reverent fear that causes you to tremble? Ah, I don't know. That's something a little more profound... Talking to me, tell me, well, I don't know what he's talking about fear. I don't know about you, but I'm scared. Who can stop the Lord, man? And I fear him. I don't fear him. In a, I mean, I respect him, but man, I fear God. Are you kidding me? Maker of everything, heaven and earth? Oh, no. When I work out my salvation, knowing what will happen in the coming, I have a tremble to it. I don't want to be left behind. I don't want to be that one. I do not. Just because of my mouth, I have a loose mouth, I will put that mouth in check. Because I have loose eyes that want to see things that I should, I put my eyes in check. Why? Because I have a fear. I don't want to be caught in things, in stupidity, when that moment comes. That makes sense? Man, you got to have that reverent fear on you. No wonder Jesus says, before the sun goes down. You know what scripture I'm about to say? Before the sun goes down, man, make peace with your loved ones. Forgive each other before the sun goes down. Why? Because thieves come in the night. It would be a terrible thing for you to be holding grudges when the sun returns. Terrible thing. Amen? Release it. Have a fear and trembling on you. You know what? I just need to let this go for my own life's sake first. And then for the sake of others that are around me. For the sake of husbands and wives, my children, my nephews, my nieces. For the sake of them, the only way you're going to have the go on you is when you have that reverent fear on you to go. To have a reality that there will be a day coming that I need to be ready. Amen? I know this is rough. You don't think I'm right now like, man, Lord, I'm going to give my life in check, man. So you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you don't expect him. 45, who then is the faithful and wise, whom the master has put in charge of the servants in his household to give them their food at their proper time? It will be good for that servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns. I tell you the truth, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. You get a blessing. 48, but suppose that servant is wicked and says to himself, my master is staying away a long time. He probably won't come during my time. He'll, pr he'll probably come way when our children are probably old and maybe they got their children. I'll be long gone from here. Uh -uh. You're going to be very much alive when Jesus returns. I don't care if it's 20, 30, 20, 90. You'll be there. You'll be alive when that horn is, doot, and it says the dead will rise first. Oh, no. Just because you think you died doesn't mean you escape this moment. It'll be a moment, a moment like any other. 
See, suppose the master stays, stays, says, my master's staying away a long time. And then he begins to beat his fellow servant and to eat and drink with drunkards. See, he goes on with life, right? 50. The master of that sermon will come on a day when he does not expect him and at an hour when he is not aware of. Golly. He will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the what? With the hypocrites. Man, that shows you there is a place for hypocrites. What does it look like? This is what a place for hypocrites look like. It's a place where there will be what? And what? Gnashing of teeth. Oh my gosh. Most of us judge Christians as hypocrites. Here the Lord is judging the unbeliever a hypocrite. Do you see that? You think a hypocrite is your fellow Christian who's not coming to church or whatever? The Lord is judging the unbeliever a hypocrite. He's calling them hypocrites. Didn't give their full faith in. Knowing good and will, they knew a creator, but with their minds, they denied Christ. All those people that don't believe, they know good and will. There's a God. They know it. They know it. They know it. I know because Romans says it. But they reject him. Oh, God is just. God is just. There will not be one person during that time that says, I never knew. Oh, no, you knew. Everybody knew. There will not come a day. I didn't know. Oh, no, no, trust me. The Lord will make sure everybody had an opportunity. You understand? It's a serious moment. You got to live your life knowing this moment is on the rise. What does that mean? You live in fear every day. No, you live in a freedom in Jesus. Letting the other stuff go, it's not good for you anyway. It cuts our lives short. It brings drama to the life. You understand? We don't need all that trash anyway, do we? I mean, my gosh. It says, but suppose that servant is wicked and says to himself, my master is staying away a long time. And then he begins to beat his fellow servant, eat and drink with drunkards. Fifty. The master of that sermon will come on a day when he does not expect him, and at an hour he is not aware of. He will cut him to pieces, assign him a place with the hypocrites where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I'm going to go to Luke chapter 17. Same account. This is kind of the same story. Luke chapter 17, verse 22. On these type of sermons, I don't expect any amens. Don't need them. The word alone is doing the work. Amen? Yeah, yeah, you know, the word alone. Just let him do the work. It's all right if it's a silence in here. It's okay. It's good for meditation, you know? Think about what I'm saying. It's good. It's good. 1722. Look what it says here. When he said to his disciples, the time is coming when you will long to see one of the days of the Son of Man. But you will not see it. Men will tell you, there he is. There's going to come a day. Men will say, there he is. There's Jesus. Or, here he is. The Lord said, there's going to be people like that. Look what he says. Do not go running off after them. So when you have people saying, I think I see Jesus. Don't go running after him. Wait, here's Jesus. I think I see him here. Don't go running after him. He says, don't do that. Don't go running and flocking to where they think they just saw me. Don't do it. Why? 24. For the Son of Man in his day will be like lightning. There ain't going to be no time for discussion. I think I see Jesus. Dude, no, you don't. It's going to be like lightning in that moment. Wow! You know what I mean? Powerful. No time to react or say, <laughs> whatever you were in that moment millionth of a second that's the moment he finds you be ready it says for the son of man in his day will be like lightning so don't go following just because someone says I saw Jesus over here don't go following over there it's already wrong <laughs> he says when I come it's going to be like lightning which flashes 
and lights up the sky from one end to the other. That's how it's going to be. You ain't got time to discuss nothing. Whoa! Done. It says, but first he must suffer many things and be rejected by his own generation. 26. Just as it was in the days of who? So also will it be in the days of the Son of Man. People were eating, drinking, marrying, being given in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. Then the flood came and destroyed them all. I mean, all of them. It was the same in the days of Lot. Y'all remember Lot, Abraham and Lot? He said, same thing. I had to do the same thing back then again. After I destroyed him with a flood, then I had to destroy this whole city. It says people were eating and drinking. Look at this. They were buying and selling. They were doing business. They were off making their money, getting their paychecks when this happened. It says eating, drinking, buying and selling. They were planting and some of them were even building. Boy, build your homes now. Get it over with. <laughs> the Lord's coming soon. It says, look at this, it's 29. But the day Lot left Sodom, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. This is what happens when the godly leave a city. Let me say that again so it'll get you real good. This is the way it looks when the godly leave a city. Abraham said, Lord, surely you won't kill the righteous with the unrighteous. Remember he said that? He said, if there's 50, and the Lord said, all right, if there's 50, you're right. I don't kill the righteous with the, the unrighteous. I don't. They don't get the same thing. The unrighteous have another reward for them. And he said, all right, if there's 50 in the city. Then Abraham said, ooh, I'm a businessman. What if there's 40? The Lord said, all right, if there's 40. Ooh, Lord, what if there's 30? All right, if there's 30, what if there's 20? He went all the way down to 10. And then it says, after that, the Lord left him because the Lord knew there wasn't no more than that in there. There was no need to discuss anymore. He was going to keep his promise. The righteous will not die in the same way as the unrighteous. In Revelation, right? All you Bible thumpers. People were eating and drinking, buying and selling. They were planting and building. But the day Lot left Sodom, see that? The day Lot left, it says, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. It, was, it will be just like this on the day of the Son of Man is revealed. It will be just like that. So he's liking it too. It'll be just like that flood, everybody eating and drinking, and all of a sudden, whoosh, gone. You ain't got time to do nothing. Or the time of Lot. Remove the people out of the city, fire, show, took the whole city out. While people are getting married, while babies are being born, while people are carrying on their daily business of making money, buying and selling. That stuff ain't going to matter no more. On that day, no one who is on the roof of his house, watch this. On that day, no one who is on the roof of his house with his goods inside should go down and go get them. Forget that stuff. It says, likewise, no one in the field should remember to go back for anything. Forget it. Remember Lot's wife? I love this. This has got to be one of the shortest scriptures in the world. The only one shorter than this one that says Jesus wept. The second shortest is this one right here. Remember Lot's wife. Just in case you don't know what I'm talking about, when Lot and his wife and his family were told to leave the city, God told them, don't look back. And they all listened, except for that woman. What did she do? While going, running to the rescue of Jesus, where that, was a, that was a sign of Jesus. What happened? 
she looked back at her old life. Remember Lot's wife. No time to look back. No time to look back. It says, remember Lot's wife? Whoever tries to keep his life will what? Lose it. And whoever loses his life will what? Preserve it. This is still the red letter. It's Jesus talking. I tell you. Well, when the Lord tells you that, you know he's about to tell you something. I tell you, on that night, two people will be in one bed. Boy, he goes different. Two people. Remember when he said they'll be giving in marriage? I mean, it's going to be in moments that you would think, Lord, that is a a special moment of a husband and a wife, Mm -mm. two of them will be in the bed while giving in marriage a rightful duty. Look what it says. Two people will be in the bed. One will be taken and the other left. This is serious. Two women will be grinding grain together. One will be taken and the other left. Where, Lord, they asked where there is a dead body there, the vultures will gather. Man, I'd love to go in on that a little bit, let you just think about that a little bit. This is serious moments. We have to keep our mind, our, our lives above reproach in a sense that, man, let me not get caught slipping like they say here in Southside. Don't get caught slipping. Don't get caught slipping in a moment Because you don't know in those moments. Live above reproach. Conquer those moments. And before you know it, those very temptations won't be such a temptation because you've learned to conquer it so that when Jesus does return, you're ready. You're not caught doing something dumb. When Jesus returns, so you're not caught saying something dumb. When you're not caught falling into something dumb, you know? I mean, we want to, my gosh. Look what Hebrews 11 says. I just want to show you this quick scripture here. Everybody all right? Oh, the Lord is good and gracious, but man, there is a day coming. Look, watch this. This is the way you got to do it. This is the way you do it right here. Everybody say, by faith. Say, I will live my life by faith. Now look what it says here. By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen. This is what's happening now. You understand what I'm saying? The Bible is warning us right now of things that we haven't seen yet. Right? Right? It says, by faith Noah, when he was warned about things not seen, in holy fear, he built an ark to save his, what? Family. If anything, when you come to know Jesus Christ, there should be an urgency immediately to save your family. Those ones that you love next to you, the ones you grew up with, the ones that cared for you, they gave up for you, the ones that paid the bills so you could live. You understand? Your family. When you hear the warning of the days of Noah, you should run to your fathers, your mothers, your brothers, your sisters, your nephews and nieces. They are your first ministry when you become saved. The worst thing you can do is not love your own family and say nothing because it's politically correct. Well, you believe what you believe, and I'm going to do me. You do you, and I'm going to do me. No, that's not what we're here. We're here to compel our family. Don't go to hell. I ain't going to hell. I believe in Jesus. Your life is not showing it. If you ain't tricking me, you definitely can't trick God. 
But I believe, I say, I believe in Jesus. How are you going to judge me? I ain't judging you. You're being judged right now by the word of God. Jesus said you will know them by their fruit. You ain't got no fruit. Even the devils know Jesus. And they still go into hell. You understand what I'm saying? This is the kind of thing that, ne- that Noah got on him. It says that he started building a boat when it was drought. In other words, you are going to be preaching a ridiculous thing to people. They will think what you're saying is ridiculous. It'll be an equivalent of trying to build a boat in a desert. They'll look at you like, what are you? You are crazy. You're crazy. I'm trying to tell you so that it won't be on your head. It says that Noah preached to them and they mocked him. They made fun of him. They came down making fun of him, drinking and wine and being merry and all that. You dummy, what are you doing? Why are you acting this way? Come on, come back over here. We were cool. Remember, now you act different. You're away from us. Why aren't you over here with us anymore? Used to be cool back then. You used to be cool. We used to all be good. Why do you got to do this? Why do you got to separate yourself? Is your God calling you to say, God is going to make you go do something dumb like this? This is the kind of accusations you will get. It will be the same as in the day of Noah. You will be made fun of. You will be ridiculed by your own family, by your own neighbors. But Noah did not care because he had the fear of the message that was told to him. And what did he do? Sons, this is what's going to happen. Daddy, you sound crazy. I know I sound crazy, but you're going to be right here with me. You're going to help me build this boat. Dad, come on, man. Boy, listen to me. Boy. You got to get that old man strength on you. Boy, you listen to me, you know. Just get in here. I said, get in here. <laughs> Dude, like the Hispanics pull out that whip. Oh, God, get in there, boy. You know what I mean? You got to compel. Get them in. They don't know any better. This is the kind of preaching you got to give your people. Why? Because you were given a message and a holy come on you in this message. I got to save my children. I, this is not the time to go easy and well, I don't want to offend them. This is not the time anymore. You don't know when Jesus is coming. You understand? This is the time the Holy Spirit is drawing. He's bringing people in. You're going to see people that have been away from the Lord for a long time and all of a sudden they're going to be asking you questions. you got to pick up on that stuff. Bring them in. Bring them in. If you got to leave wherever you're at, go wherever you Come on in. you got to bring them in. you got to compel them. You will have brothers and sisters and family members that have ever asked you about Jesus and all of a sudden you're going to hear the one question and your ear is going to pop up and I pray that you remember this time that that holy fear will come on you. Save all that you can. We are in the days of Noah. It says in holy fear he built an ark to save his family. Did you hear that scripture that Sister Nina gave out earlier? If you don't know how to take, out of your, take care of your own household, you're worse than an infidel, it says. Did you know that? If you ain't even trying to work your own family, you're worse than an unbeliever. Even unbelievers know how to take care of their own families. Unbelievers, they'll be propping up homes and you'll be like, those silver spoons, they don't even deserve it. Yeah, but that man and that woman, was even they know how to take care of their family whether they deserve it or not. The same way unbelievers got to be. Whether they deserve it or not, you're indebted to Christ to get that message to them. To put holy fear into them. To get your lives straight. And then go save your family for an upcoming event. That you don't know when it's coming, so there must be an urgency on you. It says he did this by faith. By faith. And look what it says here. It goes even further. By his faith, he condemned the world. I love it because 
You don't even have to use the faith of God given you. You can use your own faith and make a decision. Make it come in agreement with the faith of God that comes by the, by the gifts of the Spirit. Use, I mean, use your own reckoning here. Ration it out in yourself and say, you know what, man? I think Pastor Tim's on to something here. Let me quit doing this because I don't know. If I keep doing this, I may just keep it, allow it going in my life. And before you know it, it's going to be two, three years, four years, five years. And then before you know it, Jesus comes in that moment and you still ain't kicked with that thing. Deal with it now. Golly. By his faith, by Noah's faith, he condemned the world and became the heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. Look how many times faith is mentioned in there. By faith, Noah warned. By the faith, he condemned the world. And by faith, he became righteous in the sight of God. By faith, he warned the world. By faith, he saved his family and condemned the world. And by faith, he was considered righteous. Man, can you hear what I'm saying? Oh, hear what I'm saying. By faith, he warned people. You got to do that by faith. Do you know what it feels like when your flesh is dealing with you dealing, having faith? Don't you ever wonder why the flesh don't like faith? Because faith doesn't exactly know. Faith just believes. Doesn't it talk? It takes faith for you to go talk to someone about the gospel, doesn't it? Because your flesh is like, Ooh, I don't know. What do they say? No. What do they say? What do they start judging me? Right. Your flesh all up in an uproar. That's because you don't spread the gospel with your flesh. You spread it by faith. You got to conquer those things and just say, you know what, let me just get out here and say something. It takes courage. No wonder Revelation says that the cowardly will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. It's going to be those that have courage to speak and warn and give truth. And we do it by faith. Speaking up here today to you, I do it by faith. I will get ridiculed. I will get told things, especially me working in government. I'm telling you, they got all kinds of ideas. But I must use my faith to stand in the holy fear that I'm in right now. Amen? Last scripture. Go to 1 Peter 3.18. Man. Oh, let this ring in your father. Let it ring in our spirits, father, in our souls, Lord. Oh, Father, let us not forget, Father, that it's all about this moment here, Lord. This is the moment we're talking about. I love the Holy Ghost. I love being in the glory. I love in the basking in the presence of the Lord. But when there is no time, when you're not in those moments, you are out giving your life to these things, preparing these people. You're building an ark of salvation. And the first ones you should be speaking to is your family. Look what it says here. For Christ died for sins once for all. The righteous for the unrighteous. He was the righteous and we were the unrighteous. To bring you to God. That's what he did. He gave up ridicule. He was slapped. He was beaten. He was made fun of. He was ridiculed. Oh, if you're who you are, come down from there now. Oh, he was made a joke. But he gave up the, the righteous for the unrighteous. That's what you do. You give up yourselves for the sake of others. It says, to bring them to God. That's what you're supposed to do. If you don't know how to do it, keep coming to church so you can work on it. If you still don't know how to do it, just invite them here. We'll work on them for you. You understand? Just get them here. Promise them a Whataburger afterwards. Get them here. Buy lunch for them afterwards. Man, I'll buy you lunch. Just come on, just come. That's what needs to be done. We're in the days of Noah. It says, he was put to death in the body, but made alive by the what? Spirit. 19. Through whom also 
he went and preached to the spirits in what? Prison. 20. Who disobeyed long ago. They disobeyed long ago when God waited patiently in the days of who? Noah. Oh, he was patient. You think it took forever to build that ark? No, the Lord was being patient. Noah, just work on the bottom half today. Just work on this one section today. Go and enjoy yourself. He was being very patient. He gave plenty of time. There will be nobody in those last days saying, I didn't know mm -mm, the Lord was patient. It said he waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. So while the Lord is preparing a place for us, while we're out there gaining the family that we can while this ark is being prepared, your job is to bring people into the ark of salvation. Just come in. Just come in in the hopes that if you walk out, fine, but at least I got you in here and you, you, you had to choose to walk out. Do you understand? Because there will be a time when the hand of the Lord finally closes that door and that opportunity won't be there anymore. Do you understand what I'm saying? It says, it's going to be, he's waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it only a few people, eight in all, were saved through what? You see, the water that destroyed one saved the other. The fire that destroys one will be the fire that purifies the other. You understand what I'm saying? That's why we don't have to fear. Because the judgment that goes on them will be the blessing for us. Where they drowned, we were baptized. You understand what I'm saying? In it only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. Verse 21. And this water symbolizes what? That now saves who? You also. Not the removal of dirt from your body, but the pledge of a good conscience towards God. When you get baptized, you are making a vow with God. You are pledging to have a clean conscience. I'm not going to cuss. I'm not going to do dirty business. I'm not going to cheat still. I'm going to honor God. Everything that I do will be to honor God. I will serve others. I will serve my church. I will tell others about what Jesus has done in my life. I will invite people to church. I'm going to quit my old ways. I'm not going to speak the way I spoke anymore. I'm not going to make decisions the way I decided I used to a long ago. I'm not part of Southside anymore, so I don't think it's cool anymore. I'm not in the hood. I'm out in the kingdom. I don't have nothing to do with this area anymore. I'm a passerby. I'm nothing like them anymore. I was once from them, but now I've been found, and I'm not like that anymore. Totally changed. I keep a good conscience towards God. It's my pledge to him when I went down in that water. It's the pledge, you understand? It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 22. Who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him? Jesus. It's all about the Lord. Let's all stand up. Save your families. If anything, save your families. If you want to receive Jesus today, just come on up here. Ain't no time to waste. If you want to receive Jesus today, just come on up here.
I don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. Jesus don't even promise you tomorrow. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Press on the heart, Lord. Press on the heart, Lord. I was 19 years old. I had just graduated from high school. I remember I got a job at the Botanic Gardens. It was just cleaning the outside and restrooms and setting up rooms. And I just thought it was a good job. And I remember I was headed, headed out to the Japanese gardens. If y'all know Botanic Gardens, I was headed up the hill and I was in a little cart because I was going to go clean the restrooms up there. And I stopped and I saw a friend I just graduated with. And I, 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 he was a Christian friend. His name was Matt. His name was Matt, Matthew. I remember I, I saw Matthew and everything in me. He was a good friend. And everything in me, Matt, I wanted to call out. But right when I did that, I noticed his face was downtrodden. He, he, he had a down face, and he looked very not Matthew. And I stopped. I was 19, you know. I, man, he looks like he had a bad day. And I stopped, and he walked on and got lost in the parking lot and never saw him again. And a week later, I got that his father found him, that he had shot himself under the covers. Don't let time go by. Give your life to the Lord. I remember I told myself I'd never let that happen again. I carried that weight. I carried that weight so much, look, I became a preacher. I'm telling you, there ain't nothing special about me. All I am is a man that I fear the Lord now. I got a revelation of the Lord. I fear Him. Oh, I invite the fear of the Lord in this place. I invite the fear of the Lord in this place. Proverbs says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. <laughs> Don't you tell me that I, yeah. Don't tell me I'm in the wrong don't tell me when I fear God. It's the beginning of wisdom. Anybody want to dedicate their life, give their life to Jesus, come on up, come on up. Just come on up. I'm already up here by myself. Come on up, come on up. Just rededicate your life right here. Just give it to the Lord in Jesus' name. Rededicate my life. Anybody else? else you just feel a draw don't fight it don't fight it come on come on just just don't don't fight it anymore no need to fight it just give it to the Lord give it to the Lord anybody want to get saved it's the first time to give their life to Jesus anybody here never done it before you may have thought you did it in your house well that don't count I'm telling you right now I don't know who came up with that the Lord says if you do it before men I'll do it before my father that's what he says in Matthew so whatever that fake thing, you can get saved in your bedroom. I'm sorry, that doesn't work. It's got to be here. It's got to be here. And there is a, there's a sense of fear of the Lord here. If you just come up right now, just come up right now. Jesus is calling you. Jesus is calling you. Jesus is calling you. He's going to change things around. It's going to change things around. Rededicate your life. No more fighting, no more fighting, no more fighting. No more fighting, Lord. We honor you, Lord. We want to give to you, Lord. A fear of the Lord in this house of reverent fear of Jesus in this house to change your lives, to redirect. I have to do this every day. I'm no different than you. I got to set my foot on the right path. I get off and I got to get back in line quickly.
because I don't know when that time will come. But I secure my life. I'm going to pray over you right now. I pray an anointing for you to go to your families right now in Jesus' name. Some of you have too many lost members in your family. And I'm hearing right now that, well, they don't listen to me anymore. I've tried. I've been the only one. God, I can hear it right now. I've been trying, and they're not listening. And I'm telling you right now, the kingdom is, of heaven is one. The kingdom of heaven is won by those that are hostile to salvation. They just don't have the give up in them. If that's you, that you've been trying, praying, praying, but you see no work, it's, it's, not, it's not happening, I want to pray for you. That you continue doing what you do. Why? Because you have a fear of the Lord. And it's the beginning of wisdom. If you have been sensing a little bit of that in you, like, man, maybe they'll send someone else. Lord, maybe they're not meant to hear, maybe. They're maybe, meant, maybe it's somebody else. If that's you that said those kinds of things, do me a favor, just raise your hand. And I've said those things, so I'm going to be the first. There you go. There you go. Keep them raised high. Keep them raised high. There you go. Yeah, a bunch of us, right? I'm thinking of those unsaved family members now. I don't want them to go to hell. Raise them up higher. Father, I pray that you give your people a, a, a newness, a message of fire to bring back, Lord. To their families, Lord. I pray that you make them a ball of fire, Lord. Like they used to be, Lord. I can almost hear that. I used to be that fire. I used to just go in there. But now I'm more silent. I pray that that silence come off of you. Because you need a louder voice more than ever before. And I pray that that fire come back to the people of the Lord. I pray that the message come back like the days of Noah, where he was made fun of, but he didn't care. He kept building and he kept inviting. I pray that that urgency come back up in the church to save, to save families. That that urgency come back up. <laughs> Break our heart, Lord. For them, Lord, there's too many out there. Bring them home. I'm charging you, but Jesus charged you. Go in there like a lion. Drag them home if you need to. A new fire. I rebuke that lie that it's not you. I rebuke that lie that maybe it's going to be somebody else. Right now, it's a free-for-all. We're in the days of Noah. The days of assignment is almost over. I can almost sense it. Jesus is saying, I'll take any one of you. I'm telling you, how do you think I got where I'm at now? Me and my wife are just nobodies that said, we'll do it. I've always said this to myself. And I believe this to be true in my heart. I believe somebody said no, and I said yes. That's all I am. Me and my wife are just a man and a woman that we came and we said, you know what? I put this, I say yes. Somebody else said no, I'll do it, Lord. I don't know how to. Ain't been properly trained, but I'll do it. That's all he needs from you. Won't you say that with me? I'll do it, Lord. Put the burn back in me. Say that again. Put the burn back in me. Say, I'll do it. Say, I'll be brave. Say, I'll be courageous. 
I'll do it, Lord. Here I am. Use me. My calling is still very much alive. Say that. I haven't lost anything. Now's the time. In Jesus' name. And may you dedicate your life to the Lord and just peace. Hallelujah. Say, I come back to you, Jesus. Forgive me that I left you. I don't want to be that wishy-washy. Say, I rebuke wishy-washy out of me. Say it again. I rebuke wishy-washy out of me. In the name of Jesus, I submit my life to you. I'm not going to come in and out of my flesh. I will remain in the spirit. I stay right here. Under your wings. Under your calling. Say, I rededicate my life. Jesus' name. Amen. Yes. Yes, please. Amen. Amen. There's going to be some ministering going on. If you have to go, let me just pray for you. We're going to keep ministering up here. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for everyone here, Lord. Thank you for this message, Father. Father, I pray that this message, Lord, oh, that it, it, it really get inside our heart, Lord. Make us balls of fire, Father. Like the disciples, Father. Oh, they were joyous when they got slandered. They got beat and they came out laughing and joying. We just got beat. Ah, ah, we're honored. We're honored to be slandered for Christ's name's sake. We're honored to be ridiculed. For Christ's name's sake, it honored. It's an honor. Thank you, Lord. I bless everyone here, Father. I bless everyone here, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. And we all say, amen. God bless you. The men's meeting, we're going to do men's meeting next Sunday, okay? Men's meeting next Sunday for all the guys, all right? It's going to be at 5, uh, five, five o'clock, is that when we normally do it? Five o'clock, five o'clock here. It's been good.